You did it again, didn't you? Did what? You know what you did. Which thing? You read the spoilers? Yes. Yes, I did. You did. For Big Little Liars? Big Little Lies? Big Little Close (laughs) Enough. Yeah. It was very stressful. It's supposed to be stressful. Do you understand why I read the spoilers? Mm, Not really. I know you've explained it to me. I understand it has something to do with empathy and you just can't handle the suspense and the... But I I just don't understand somebody who watches TV that way. I just... Okay, here's my space to explain myself. So Steve likes to watch shows that get me emotionally involved that in a way feels too intense if it's supposed to be for fun. So I'm trying to think of a show that did this too much that I just literally had to stop. Um, Highlander? What's what's that one? Oh, no, it wasn't Highlander. What, what was, was it, it called? Um, one of the ones that make me want to go to Ireland. What's the name of that show? Jamie. Yeah. Outlander. Outlander. Okay. It's like I was so emotionally invested in this show and it would just be heartbreaking and gut-wrenching. Like these people are dealing with very serious things, very heartbreaking things, very agonizing things. And it was just easier if I read every single spoiler so I understood what was happening. And that way I didn't have to experience it on an emotional level that was just crushing. (laughs) Or, But they're not real. But in the moment, I don't know that. In the moment, I can't remember that the show is not real. So for Big Little Lies, it's like the, the whole opening show, it's like this one woman is being abused by her husband and this child is accused of strangling another child. I mean, serious, huge stuff. I don't know how to watch it with like some sort of, I wish. I feel like when I was created, I don't have this wall that like separates my emotions from others' emotions or from TV emotions. It's also why I struggle with fiction. I'd rather read a memoir because if I'm going to get emotionally invested and give my whole heart to something, I need it to be real. <laughs> like I cannot. But I read A Man Called Uva. You did. Because you wanted me to read it and right. I loved it. You did. But it was hard because it was like, here my heart is aching for Uva. And he's not real, <laughs> which which is which is why I read. Does that make sense? Why I read spoilers? So if I read every spoiler of the show, like when we watched In Treatment, if I could just figure out how all their cases ended up, then I wouldn't have the anxiety, the like gnawing anxiety of worrying about these characters. Does that make sense? I guess so. <clears throat> so then I can enjoy the show with you. We just experience things completely different because I like the puzzle and the storytelling. And um, so to know how it's going to end ruins everything for me. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I just, I don't, I'm not even in a logical space in the movies. I'm in such a flooded space emotionally of like, here's Laura. Her heart is broken because she's in love with Paul. It's like, I can't even think straight because I'm feeling with Laura, even though Laura's fake. And here is where I struggle with fiction. (laughs) I guess that leads us into what we want to talk about today, which is a little of continuing conversation on empathy based on last week's podcast. Um, And why empathy comes easier to you, less easy to me, um, and to a lot of people. How everybody kind of sees it differently. But I'm starting to get the idea with the podcast you did last week and hearing YouTube videos and podcasts and things coming out of your phone all the time (laughs) about all centering around empathy. Um, I'm beginning to think it, do you think it's kind of a big deal? Welcome. 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 To celebrate. To celebrate. Story. Welcome to celebrate story. With my mom, my mom. With my mom. With my mom. With my wife. Julie Wagner. Julie Wagner. Julie Wagner. Julie Wagner. So last week's podcast you mentioned, and I think even the title was Travel for Free. Um, I think I understand what you meant by that, but if you could give me a little bit 
deeper into it. As I understood it, it's if you connect with somebody closely and kind of feel, try to feel what they're feeling, see things from their point of view, you get a window into a different world that you don't currently reside in. Yes. And I love that you you use the word try to see things from their perspective because that's all we can do, right? Like I, I might think I'm feeling from someone's perspective or seeing from someone's perspective, but the moment I assume I am, it's probably the moment I make errors and assumptions and, and that's where my curiosity stops. And so I love that a friend of mine that listens, she had such great questions. She's an eight on the Enneagram and she was like, I hear you. She was like, I'm, you know, I'm growing so much in empathy. It's something she's just really worked on in her life. She was like, but I have to say empathy does cost something. She said it makes decisions more complicated. And before it was like I could charge ahead. I was confident. I knew these decisions. But when I stop and do this, it makes things more confident or complicated. And I loved her point because I think it highlights how much I am just living in that heart space. Because for me to stop and set boundaries is what costs something because it's default for me to live in that heart space and to think about how others feel and it takes work. It's it's beyond my automatic programming to stop and think about the boundaries. And so that being said, the travel for free was, I think, the most transcendent moments I've had with other people is when me and another person, when we are armor off, boundaries down, open, curious, connecting. It's like there really is a different space between two people that don't have armor, that don't have assumptions, that are kind of meeting in that gray area. And I think that's why I get it, why it is such a big deal to me because the world is so polarized and we're so certain of our opposing opinions. But if we could loosen the polarities around our rightness and meet in that gray space, we can meet in that place that's both differentiated and yet connected. And it's it just gives us a view we do not have on our own. And it's I'm passionate about it because it those spaces bring life to me. When me and another person or me and a group of people are without armor, without walls, and truly curious and offering empathy and curiosity, it takes me to another place. It's another world. And I think that <clears throat> that doesn't come naturally to me at all to connect with people throughout the day. Um, it's just, it's the last thing that I'm thinking of. Um, but it isn't, it, I wonder sometimes if I'm missing out a bit when you come back with stories like you did from the nail salon that day. Um, oh. I mean, if you could tell, I wouldn't, you know, I don't get my nails done. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with guys getting their nails done, but I don't. So I just laugh because that's the last thing I picture of you. It just doesn't fit yeah. your vibe. But it, if I'm getting a haircut or if I'm getting something like that, I well, I, don't, I cut I don't your hair. <laughs> and, Sorry, and, <laughs> I just <laughs> keep going. And I I don't reach out for conversations with people. I like to I don't know just. It's just not natural for me. So when you come back with a story like you came back that day from the nail salon, I wonder if I don't know if I'm missing out on something. So do you want to tell that? Oh yes, I love that story. Um, it'd be great if I could get her on the podcast one day and she could tell her own story. Um, but I went, goodness, I don't remember how long ago it was. It's been several months at least. It was before the podcast started because it was another seed of a dream of having a podcast and a place to tell her story. Um, she, I don't even remember the first question. She actually gave me curiosity first. She was so curious about what I did with homeschooling and she had one child and she was, she kind of had this like in awe state, which in all honesty makes me uncomfortable because it's like, there's nothing that I'm doing that anyone else couldn't do if they wanted. It's like, I'm just following this passion of education and connection. And it, and I feel uncomfortable because you can't really con connect if someone has this like space of awe. And so I was trying really hard to like bridge the gap between 
what she thought I was and what it actually is in what I do. Because she was kind of beating herself up. She had a one-year-old and she doesn't ever read her one-year-old books. And I was like asking her questions about what she does do. And so I was just trying to point out all these just beautiful, wonderful things that she does do with her one-year-old and trying to show her like all that is education. Like you are educating your one-year-old all the time. And so we just had this really great conversation about that. And then I reciprocated the curiosity and I was starting to ask her about where she was from. And what unraveled, I wish I took notes because I don't want to mess up some of the key key pieces. And, and hopefully I can just get her on the podcast one day. I think she'd be open to it. Um, she ended up telling a story that when she was six years old, they, was it, was it Vietnam? Was it Vietnam? It was Vietnam. They basically immigrated from Vietnam to the United States. And it was a unbelievable journey. I'm talking, her mom picked her up from school one day and said, you're going to get shots. And she was like, mom, what are you talking about? I know we don't have money to go to the doctor. What are you talking about? And then they went to, they were trying to go on foot to a refugee camp. It took them weeks to get there. They ran out of food. They ran out of supplies. They were like being hunted from the officers. And they had, she just had these like really like terrifying stories of like them fighting for their lives. And then it that attempt failed and they tried it again. I think it was a few months later. And then they ended up staying with a few other families in a very small space, a very small cell space. And then they finally got released to this refugee camp. But I mean, like every question I asked her, it was just like an unfolding of another unbelievable tale of like, how is this happening? Like, it's like, making all the history books, all the headlines, all of it is coming to life right before my eyes. And her just describing that experience and how how scary it was for her and how hungry she was and how confused she was. And then I found it fascinating that how she described, because they ended up going, I think, to Raleigh at first in the United States, and how she described how it was shocking to her how other students treated the teachers because they were so disrespectful. And she looked at it as something to be so grateful to be in school. And that in Vietnam, it's like you absolutely gave utter reverence to the teacher. And she just, she was flabbergasted at the disrespect. And I've got to have her on the story, but I just remember being moved with a sense of deep gratitude to have just had a peek at her world and have a peek at what she had gone through to get here. And and then also the struggles of what it was like to be here. She's like, and it's hard here. She was like, because then you have you have to play, pay for water. And she was just comparing and contrasting what it's like to live here versus what it's like to live in Vietnam. And it's like, she just gave me, I mean, I could read a whole book on Vietnam, which actually it then prompted, I ended up reading a book to my kids, um, The Land I Love, just because I was so fascinated by her stories. And, but it's like, uh, you cannot get that from a book, like what you could get from the real live presence of another human being. Like, you get a chance to feel what she feels. And I was asking her about healing and and how she healed. And she was sharing to me about her faith and what that meant to her. And it just, it was utterly fascinating. And every time I go, I've gone in, I think three more times, I, it must've been about a year ago. And um, I'm always hoping she's there and she's not, she's been there one other time, but wasn't like my assigned person. And I was so bummed. Um, but yeah, that that to me is like, what I'm always searching for and open for because it takes me out of here and now and invites an experience and an understanding that's just beautiful. So that's an example of kind of how you interact with people empathetically through kind of outside the house. But, um, and I think it's really interesting. It's something to really think about as far as, because again, it doesn't come naturally to me. So that's outside of my comfort zone, but it's, it's really, it's a great quality you have. How? (laughs) (laughs) I just gave him. (laughs) Why did you? (laughs) Oh, Julie was excited. I gave her a compliment. 
<laughs> my eyes, I, I lifted my eyes in excitement of, oh, you're complimenting uh-huh. me. <laughs> How is that used, though, inside the house? Like, how does empathy and being empathetic towards, you know, children or me or what are some thoughts on how to apply that? Because, yes, it's great to apply it to a stranger that you meet and you get to see a new world. But what about the world that you're in all the time? And Yes, I love that. That's an excellent point because, goodness, I think it's easier to be curious about something, someone that it's most obvious you know nothing about. And it's harder to show up regularly curious about someone else and to check your assumptions. And I mean, I, the perfectionist in me could think about the ways I've really failed at this. But I'm also thinking that the box story is a good example of this. I could also tell the Zadie story. Let me start with the box story. The box story. Do you want to tell the box story? From my perspective? Yeah, let's tell it from your perspective. <laughs> my and then, perspective? And then I'll share my perspective, and then the listener can travel to the world of merging our perspectives. So it was a Sunday? Sunday morning. It was a Sunday morning. Julie had said she wanted cinnamon rolls, so I dutifully... Wait, don't. hold on. I just didn't what? want cinnamon rolls. I was longing for cinnamon oh, rolls. <laughs> you were longing for cinnamon rolls because the cinnamon... Cineholic, the cinnamon roll place near us... I mean, Julie tends to decide that she wants cinnamon rolls at like seven o'clock at night. And they're sold out. So I think two or three times at least we've gone there and they've been out of cinnamon rolls. It's so very sad. It's it is very it's disappointing. Very, very sad. So I donned an apron and decided to make some <laughs> I didn't have an apron on, but I did decide to make some cinnamon rolls from scratch. So I'm doing that. Which is so you. Is this is what I'm after, this is what yeah, I want, and I'm, you make it happen. I mean I wanted them too, but yeah. <laughs> you wanted them too. <laughs> But the uh, then at the same time, I think our kids were playing outside, and to kind of control that, you invited neighborhood kids into our house. So there was well, because some of our kids had gone into another house, and then one of our kids was feeling left out. And I'm not the type that's like, "Can my last kid come in your house?" I'm like, "Oh, I'll just invite them all in our house," which we typically just have all the all the families on our street typically just have all the kids play outside. So this was an exception. So I said, Steve, can I just invite them in and all the kids can go in the basement? Yeah. So on top of the eight kids we had, we had, what, four or five others? Well, Zach and Zane were at work. Gotcha. Okay. Anyway, so I'm making... And Julie goes out on a run. A long run. Yeah. And then I start getting texts. I was like, send Zoe with the golf cart. And I was thinking, wow, Julie got hurt while she's running. Because the last time I texted her while I was running, I had broken my ankle. But she's like... I need, we need to pick up this. And she sends me this picture of this huge refrigerator box. And I'm like, that'll never fit on a golf cart. I was like, and <laughs> so I, I think I was at a stopping point on the cinnamon roll. So I ran in, grabbed the car, keys, ran out, found where she was, which Julie's not the best at giving directions. Um, so it was a little bit tough to find her. <laughs> wound throughout our neighborhood pull up and she's standing by this refrigerator box that's a couple feet taller than she is and um as i pull up a lady from the house comes out she comes out of the house and she's like can i help you talking to julie and i'm like and so i'm just kind of standing back because i don't like confrontation she was like they said i could have this box pointing to the guys who were moving the the uh, refrigerator. And she's like, that's my box. <laughs> and then Julie's like, well, if it's your box, I don't need to take it. They just said I could have it. So there was this tense little standoff on whose box whose was it going to be? And why am I here with a van? And I don't know. Um, so we end up having to move all the seats in the van around, collapse them down, take out car seats, break down the box and kind of shove it in. And um, I may have pulled away a little a lot. I was. Julie claims my tires were <laughs> squealing as I pulled away, and they were absolutely not squealing. You, Steve, you, yeah, you. Uh, well, let me. I just was a start, little frustrated. You a little frustrated because yeah. there were kids in our house, and I was making cinnamon rolls, and and I was having you come and, get uh, a box. We have a big box in our garage. Well, let me tell my <laughs> side of the story. 
do you know that in February, I like to do a unit called What to Do with a Box? I feel like it's a great time of year. The winter is setting in and you just need more imagination and creativity in the winter when there's less time outside that you can play. Certainly, you can still play outside. And so I enjoy doing like an imagination box unit. And I've always wanted a giant refrigerator box, but have never found the lead to get a free refrigerator box. And so imagine my surprise after mile two, about to start going uphill, I see two men delivering a refrigerator and tossing the box aside like it was trash, utter trash. And then I look in the the back of the truck and there's like a whole box full or a whole like truckload of these. And I'm like, should I text the group neighborhood text? Like maybe every mother in the neighborhood wants their own box. I refrain from that because I realized that maybe not everyone thought that this was such a treasure. So I texted Steve. I lugged the box across the street once they said, I said, what are you going to do with it? They said, we throw it away. I said, can I have it? They said, yes. I hauled it across the street and babysat my box, which that's why the lady came out of the house because she thought it was her box to have to deal with. And then I was worried I was stealing her box because surely she'd want her box. Who wouldn't want their giant box? And so it turned out, no, she just thought that she had to dispose of it. Anyway, so I'm babysitting my box. I text Steve. He doesn't respond right away. And then I'm like, oh, no, like when I can't get this box home. Like I can't run a mile or two home with this giant box. And so I'm picturing Zoe coming on the golf cart. I do think it would have fit on the golf cart. The box was bigger than the golf cart. (laughs) So I then call Steve and explain to him, and I'm just like fully in this moment of like, I've got the best best box that has ever been received. I think the last time I had a box that good was like three or four years ago when we bought the couch from Ikea. And that was, I mean, that was the best box before this box. It was magical. It was, it was 2018 because I just scrapbooked that year. Okay, so I was so excited. And so imagine my surprise when with great energy, he's setting all the stuff in the van very quickly and very, not forcefully, very emphatically. You were emphatically placing everything in and just very emphatically and methodically placing it. And I'm thinking, hmm, he's not as excited about my box as I am. I'm starting to question. So it it really wasn't going to even fit in the van. And he ha- ended up having to break it down, took all the seats out, f- put all the seats down, put it in, and then left kind of like not screeching tires, but driving fast, which I was so excited about my box. I was going to abandon the end of the run. But there wasn't room in the car for you to sit because of how big the box was. Yes. And so he piled all the stuff in the back in the driver's side. And I realized, oh, I'm not going to, in my mind, I pictured like a celebratory drive home with our box. like It was probably better you weren't in there. <laughs> I probably was better I wasn't in there. And so he drove my box home fast, very fast. And then as I'm running, I'm like, okay, you know, the old Julie that's codependent would believe he's mad. I'm in, I, I've done something wrong, but I've been working very hard on not owning others' anger or frustration. It was frustration. And so I'm working through it. And it was empathy skills that allowed me to come to a healthy place because we certainly have had things like that that didn't end in a healthy way. So I ran the last mile or so and came home and I was like, you know what? I just realized I left you with a house full of neighborhood kids and cinnamon roll making. And then I'm asking you to pick up a giant box. I'm really sorry. And I just got really excited because this was a big score for me. And thank you for coming to get it. And I'm really sorry that I was, you know, demanding you come get my box. And I can't remember exactly what you said at that point, but you were no longer. I softened. You softened. (laughs) But I think if I used used an empathetic method on that, I would have seen how excited you were about it. And then it was going to be exciting for the kids eventually and that sort of thing. So... You did see how exciting it was for him on Friday. Did you love seeing them play with the box? (laughs) Yes, they played with the box. (laughs) Yes. I think I had a window into this to empathy a few years ago. I was reading a book by Brene Brown. 
Um, at the same time, I was having some issue with a kind of close family member. Um, and she used a line in it that I think fits with what you've been, what we've been talking about with empathy, what you've been talking about. And it was her looking at a person that she has, she had an issue with and remembering or telling herself or just coming at them with the thought that this person in front of me is doing the best they can with the tools and experiences that they have available to them. Um, that if, and it really, it gives a real perspective when you're having a disagreement with somebody that they're not necessarily out to get you or, um, looking to hurt you that they're dealing with stuff too. And they're dealing it with the, the best, the way they know how the only way they've know how. Um, I don't know. It kind of, it, the talk about empathy just kind of, it, it pulls me back to that because that helped me see that situation differently, that it's not all about me with what they're doing. They're dealing with stuff too, and they're doing the best they can. Yes. And it makes me think of that quote by Rumi, that we're all just walking each other home. Like what? In this life, we're going to bump into each other and step on toes and hurt and be hurt. But at our core, we're all just walking each other home. We're all just doing the very best we can with what we got. I just, those ideas move me deeply. Last week, you talked about how important empathy is for communication and alluded to how it could be a solution to some of the problems that we have and the divisiveness you hear out on airwaves, social media, that sort of thing. One of the things you mentioned towards the end of the podcast, um, almost in passing was something called an empathy museum. And I know you, you had heard that term from someone and it, but it's also a somewhat of a vision that you have for, to do on this podcast going forward. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes. And I have, it's still in the vision dream stage, but I think about just, you know, what you were just saying about things change dramatically for you in that conflict when you realized this person's doing the best they can. And I think with what they have, I think that is what's so fascinating to me about traveling to the universe of connection. It's like, wow, okay, here's an example. I've got two friends. They don't know each other. They're in different circles, but are on dramatically different ends of the spectrum in the whole COVID debate. And it's like knowing them both for several years, I know exactly. It makes sense completely why they have come to the positions that they have come to in this great debate. And I often long for a way to share those stories or, you know, uh, long for a way to like help bridge that, like to be a bridge because it feels like if you only knew the heartbreak behind her decision here, you would never, ever, ever be upset with, you know, why they came to this decision. And so I dream of, okay, maybe a whole season having between four and six guests and asking them about things that shaped them and that brought them pain and what have the, what has been their greatest struggle and, you know, how did they overcome it? And then ask them questions on some of these more divisive topics because it becomes, it loosens the polarities. It loosens the differences. And it's like, once you can see yourself and another, another human of like, wow, that was so heartbreaking the way that their child was so hurt from that. Of course, they'd be advocating this or wow, they're fighting for their child here. Of course, they'd advocate for that. And it's like, I don't know. It just helps us see ourselves in another human to go deep, to take the time to really, really listen to some snapshots of pain from another person's story 
and put that in context of where their position is. So, um, and I'm by by far no expert at it, but I certainly have a passion for investigating it. I mean, and I think it's harder to do, like you referenced earlier, it's harder to do with your own your own family um, on a day in and day out basis, but it's important in both places. <clears throat> Maybe not even, I mean, I really like that idea of getting different perspectives. Um, and it does, I, you said pains or that sort of thing, but I think it's also just stories of knowing where someone comes from during happy times and to just how different families. And I, I think with all the stuff that happened kind of post George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, you know, that sort of thing is I took, and I'm not an expert by any means, cause you know, I'm a white 40 year old person who grew up 43. in 43, 40 ish <laughs> <laughs> who grew up in the suburbs and just get, so my perspective is different than, but trying to listen to some podcasts and read some books and just kind of get a, a different vision of what it's like to grow up in different cultures, even here within the United States. It's just, it, it just has a different vision, you know, and, you know, I grew up listening to rap music that I, my parents would probably rather me not listen to. Um, so I had, but, and they hearing, listen, so don't tell them you're listening to rap music. <laughs> I think the cat's out of the bag. I'll take the heat now. I'm just, I'm being funny. <laughs> um, but, you know, I listened to a podcast series from, I think it was from NPR, um, that kind of got into that world and how, I don't know, the stuff we were seeing as teenagers, you know, of rappers rapping about the police and drugs and all this kind of stuff. It, it Hearing it from a different perspective and kind of where, where some of that stuff comes from, it, it just softens and it gives you a more of a perspective of culture versus, I don't know, um, that the culture you're living in is just one culture within many, many that lots of people have different perspectives and it, it informs the way you go through your day as you're walking down the street and you think someone is being loud or rude or something like that, maybe from my white middle-class suburban culture that is out of place, but it, maybe it's not in another culture. Yeah, you it, just never know the meaning. And it comes from the phrase, the fear of the other comes to mind. I can't remember who taught that to me in my research on empathy but they were talking about obstacles to empathy is the fear of the other. It's like, as long as we are afraid of someone different than us, we can't experience empathy. We can't go, we can't take that free experience. It's like a, you have to accept this level of connectivity that we are not different. We are not as different as our circumstances make us seem. And I think to take that back to parenting, <clears throat> as we've grown in parenting and we see our kids do things. I don't know. It's, I mean, it's stereotypical, right? You know, the fifties dad, sixties dad, seventies dad, and their kid comes home with an earring or, um, long hair or, you know, that sort of thing. And it, that it seems to be something that becomes a point of contention, even though it's just the style or a, um, <laughs> when you look at parenting from an empathetic standpoint, your kids are just trying to fit in. They're they're in the culture they're in. And you have to as a as a parent know that things are changing. Um that you can't that when you were a kid you were doing things I was listening to rap music and my parents didn't like that kind of rap music. Um but I did it anyway because my friends were and it was just the kind of the cool thing to do. Um so I think looking at it I don't know where I'm going with this. Do you know where I'm going with this? <laughs> You're saying that parenting from an empathetic perspective, you have to realize the kids are in a culture and they have their own need of fitting in. Just like we want to look at other cultures that are different from us. We have to remember that our kids are in a different culture than we are. 
Is that what you were saying? I think so. I think you said it better than I could have. Oh, wow. (laughs) No, I think that's an excellent point because, and not just a different culture, but different personalities. I mean, I'm continually trying to fight this assumption that my kids are going to be like me in a circumstance, that their personality is so different and they're motivated and inspired in different ways. They get energy in different ways. I mean, I think my more introverted kids, I'm constantly trying to make them extroverted. Yeah, there's, they're a different culture in so many ways, not just a time period, but personality wise. There's so much, there's so much difference, which is beautiful. The difference makes the beauty. Yeah, we wouldn't always want to be the same. That'd be boring. It really would. And that reminds me of the quote by Desmond Tutu that I was just chewing on. Differences are not intended to separate, to alienate. We are different precisely in order to realize our need of one another. And that to me is such a beautiful summary of what empathy does. It helps us see that our differences are not intended to separate us, to alienate us. We are different precisely in order to realize our need of one another. You know, Dan Siegel was telling a story on one of the videos I was watching with him. He is a um, interpersonal neurobiologist. I think I've referenced him on the podcast before, but he told this story. He's a um, psychologist but a first was in medical school and he was juxtaposing these two experiences he had where he was by night a suicide hotline representative. And what he was intensely trained to do was enter into another person's experience, empathy. He was trained to wherever that other person was to do everything it took to enter their experience and be present with them. And then by day, a few years later, he was in medical school and he would like be in a room and the attending doctor that was training him would be like, you have this liver disease, you'll be dead in four months and they'd leave the room. And he would tug on the um, doctor's coat like, whoa, 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 don't we have to go back in there and like ask them how they feel? And the doctor in charge would be, you know, they didn't see that as their area, their concern. Well, Dan Siegel ended up dropping out of medical school and, and went the interpersonal neurobiology bi- biology route and, you know, has gone a different path because to him, this just absolute lack of presence and desire to see the world from the other person's perspective was just intolerable to him. And it's like, that is so interesting to me that suicide hotlines are training people on how to be present with others. And I'm like, is it naive to dream that we would all want to do that before someone is at the point of suicide? Like what we can offer to someone with giving our whole presence and giving empathy is life-giving for both of us. I think the greatest barrier to our grasping some of these ideas and really fleshing them out, really living them out is our hyper individualized world. Richard Rohr says that it's impossible to have community when a culture values individualization so much. We are so hyper individualized. And what comes to mind is a story Dr. Dan Siegel tells of he went to a tribe. I, I wish I could remember the specific name. I'll try to get the link. Um, to a tribe in Africa that he was doing some research there and he noticed that, okay, here is an area that is ravaged with famine and with disease and truly just heartbreaking circumstances. And the people were so happy. And so he asked the translator, they were around the fire and he asked the translator, I need you to ask them why they are happy. And the translator looked at him like, what? You want me to ask them why they're happy? I said, yes, I want you to ask them why they're happy. And so he asked, he asked the translator to do this. And the response was 
We are happy because we belong to each other and we belong to the earth. And this is startling to me because here we are in our culture, we have so much and we are so individualized and so independent and we are clinging and clawing to our independence. And yet many of us struggle with a sense of belonging, a sense of community, a sense of togetherness. And that to me is the vision. That to me is the dream that empathy can bring. Empathy can bring connection. Empathy can bring a better world where we don't see each other's differences, but we see how we're all together. We're all on the same journey, just walking each other home. You're lost in sorrow. You see your yesterday, but I see tomorrow. You see the darkness, but I see the spark. You know your failures, but I know your heart. You're a young spirit, an old soul. They would know